Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the 2021 TV TB Davy Memorial Lecture on Academic Freedom. Uh, my name is Pierre de Vos, and I'm the acting chair of the Academ Academic Freedom Committee, who under whose auspices uh, this event is held every year. It's a very important event on the UCT calendar. Uh, and I'm uh, really delighted to welcome you all here uh, for this event. Of course, we would really have loved to do this in person, but because of the COVID-19 pandemic, that is not possible. Hopefully next year, um, vaccinations permitting, we will again be able to do it in person. Um, the uh, program for the night is, uh, after my introduction, the Vice Chancellor will say a few introductory words. I will then introduce the speaker um, and then um, the speaker will uh, will deliver the, the lecture. Um, at the end, there will be time for questions. So, um, and you can you can type your questions into um, the quest Q&A box. If you just look at the top, uh, of the Teams uh, app, you will see there's a little question mark. You can click on it and type your questions. Uh, so feel free to do so uh, during the lecture um, as well as at the end. Uh, so, uh, but first, um, it's my task first to introduce the, the Vice Chancellor, Mamukhet, Professor Mamukhet Akin. She, of course, doesn't need any introduction. So, Kheti, it's over to you. Uh, for introductory remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pedifos. Members of the Academic Freedom Committee, students, colleagues, alumni and friends, good evening. Dumelang Molueni Huyanand, and welcome to this 55th TB Davy Memorial Lecture, which is hosted by the Academic Freedom Committee at the University of Cape Town. As Professor Pierre Defoe said, I'm Professor Mamukhati Pake. It's always good to introduce myself, Pierre. Some people might be in the audience from Cambodia and they've never met me. So I'm a full professor of mathematics education and currently the 10th Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Town. And I'm delighted that you could join, you could all join us this evening at our second virtual TB Davy Memorial Lecture, which again affords us the opportunity of welcoming guests from across the globe. This annual lecture, hosted by the Academic Freedom Committee, a committee of counsel, offers a platform for our institution to invite distinguished speakers to discuss a theme related to academic and freedom and human freedom. Tonight's lecture is presented by Professor Yunus Balem from the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of the Witwatersrand. Professor Balim is also the founding vice chancellor of Salt Lake University, and his lecture tonight will examine teaching, learning, and student development in the context of academic freedom. Like Professor Balim, this is a subject that is top of priority for me. I share his concerns about how we successfully entrench an institutional culture at UCT that supports rather than undermines the rights of our students to learn freely at our university. I also concur that to develop our students into critically engaged intellectuals of the future, we must give full expression to the liberating value of education. UCT's ambitious Vision 2030 is a strategic journey upon which our institution recently embarked, and it is based on the three pillars of excellence, transformation, and sustainability that were informed by the fact that whilst UCT performs very well in terms of most teaching and research indicators, we need to become even more determined to sufficiently respond to the needs of a generation of diverse students and academics who are eager to take on the world's challenges. I believe that ongoing interrogation of the curriculum is essential for UCT, constructive, open engagement and contestation is necessary, as is the diversity, the diversity of opinions and views. We need to bring intellectual curiosity and vigor into this interrogation if we are to ensure ongoing and critical accountability, not only for our scholars, but for the institution as a whole. Curriculum change or curriculum review, in my opinion, is a creative, inclusive way of shaping a more representative future it is 
in its consequence, a profound act of transformation. There is a lot of discomfort associated with the terms disruption and change, but the reality is that UCT has been living in a state of disruption for more than half a decade. In 2015, the university faced a range of unprecedented events, including the student protests, first roads must fall, followed by other protests, including fees must fall and outsourcing must fall. The tragic passing of the late health sciences faculty dean, Professor Bongani Mayosi in 2018, and the late, um, and the horrific rape and murder of first year student, Winene in 2019. And more recently, we've battled a crisis with higher education funding and the devastating wildfire of the Table Mountain, along with the impacts of COVID-19, all of which brought additional challenges to the table. So if you like, we've been managing a crisis situation since 2015, practically nonstop. So as we continue to face a combination of factors that pose very real threats to us as individuals and as an institution, we realize that we must embrace disruption as a means to propel us into action. But we must embrace disruption as a catalyst for institutional change rather than constantly working reactively to address challenges. I'm confident that UCT's Vision 2030 will be the strategy that allows us to lift the bar on UCT's ability to engage in challenging and, 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 and unconventional discussions with the aim of ultimately bolstering the academic standing of our institution. I want to thank the members of the Academic Freedom Committee and their acting chair, Professor Perry Force, for their valued commitment to academic freedom and for opening this UCT platform for other voices and, and alternative viewpoints. I now call on Professor DeForce to introduce this evening's speaker. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor King, for the introductory remarks. Um, yes, so um, it is my happy task to, as the acting chair of the Academic Freedom Committee, to introduce the speaker for the 2021 TV Davy Academic Freedom Lecture. So the Academic Freedom Committee uh, uh, in 2018 recognized that academic freedom is not only a concern, as some people might have thought, of the humanities and social sciences, that all academics across disciplines and also um, all students, members of the wider community, are impacted by an absence of academic free freedom or threats to academic freedom. And so we decided that each year we will ask a different um, uh, faculty in, at, in the UCT community to nominate potential speakers uh, within their discipline to deliver the lecture. And this year it was the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment who had to recommend a speaker and we were delighted uh, that one of the names put forward was that of Professor Yunus Balin, who will deliver, as you heard, the lecture tonight uh, that is entitled Ours, to, Ours is to Educate, Not to Captivate Teaching, Learning and Student Development in the Context of Academic Freedom. Now, as you've also heard, Professor Balim is really, uh, it looks like a civil engineer and he currently holds personal professorship in civil engineering at Wits University. He has also served at, as the head of school of civil and environmental engineering at Wits and his research is mainly in the field of cement and concrete material science. In preparation for this event, I went to look at one of his most widely cited papers entitled something like Reinforcing Corrosion and the Deflection of RC Beams, an experimental critique of current tests and methods, but it was a bit more complicated than average constitutional court judgment. So unfortunately, I, I didn't manage to finish it. But Tonight, Professor Balim is also here, I think, partly because he has served in many different leadership capacities in the higher education sector. He served as the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic and Vice Principal at Wits University. He was a member of the Council on Higher Education, and he also chaired the Higher Education Quality Committee, better known among those of us who are uh, academics as the H. EQC. 
He's also a member of the Council of Umaluzi, the body that sets and monitors the standards for general and further education and training in South Africa, where he also serves as the chair of the Assessment Standards Committee. He was also previously the chair of the board of the National Institute for Higher Education in the Northern Cape, and he was the founding vice chancellor of Salt Plaque University in Kimberley. So Professor Balim has extensive experience and obviously has thought deeply about universities, about the role of universities, um, and also about student success. Professor Balim informed me earlier that tonight's lecture will in part at least consider aspects of the institutional culture of the universities that either support or undermine the right of students to learn freely at the university. This is obviously an extremely important issue as Vice Chancellor Pakeng has also noted. So I'm sure like me you are looking forward to hear what Professor Balim will have to say on this important topic. Uh, so I'm gladly and now hand over to uh, Professor Balim to deliver the lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dufos, for that very generous introduction. Uh, I promise that tonight I'm not cementing any relationships and I'm certainly not making any concrete proposals. Uh, I will certainly try and keep away from those subjects. If you permit me uh, just a, a brief moment of indulgence. Uh, a, week of, a week ago, my mother died at an age just shy of 92. Like many of her social class and her generation then, she was taken out of school when she could write her name on the argument that this was a sufficient education for a girl child. I was raised by a mother who liked to read books. In solidarity with all those who have and continue to struggle for a proper education, I would like to also dedicate this lecture to the memory of my mother. Thank you. Madam Vice-Chancellor, Professor Pakeng, uh, in, very diff in many different contexts and a past uh, colleague of mine, uh, the previous chair of the UCT Academic Freedom Committee, uh, Professor Elalwani Ramogondo, and the current acting chair, Professor Pierre de Foss. I'm very thankful that you have chosen to invite me to reflect on academic freedom matters in a lecture that honors the memory and courageous contribution of Professor Thomas Benjamin Davy. There are times in human madness when those with their hands on the levers of power become unhinged, become convinced that the gods speak directly into their ears and that they alone are the custodians of the truth. Decisions about right and wrong are made in the trigger finger and unspeakable hurt and horror are visited on innocent and powerless people. In times like these, when the alternatives include going out to stop bullets, or to suffer serious personal injury and deprivation, university-based intellectuals serve best by rising above the pollution, breathing the clearer air, and thinking and speaking honestly to their publics. The era of totalitarianism and fascism in Europe and Asia during the early 20th century was a frightening experience for all humanity. But perhaps more frightening for us was the number of academics and intellectuals who went out in support of that brutishness. Julian Bender and Hannah Arendt have written eloquently on this matter, and an academic would do well to visit their writing on the subject. Apartheid was one such uh, moment uh, and a time in history. And Professor David chose to speak loudly when many of his academic and administrative colleagues in South African universities were either silent or actively supportive of state policy at the time. Professor Davy loudly pronounced that there is a corner in society called the university where the shadow of unreason cannot be allowed to fall. Higher education in South Africa and indeed throughout the world is a better place for this. In no small measure, it is TB Davy's focus on, the, on this matter that allows us to draw a sense of noble dignity from the idea that we live in a country where the principle of academic freedom is captured in our constitution. To deliver a lecture that celebrates this legacy is a special honor for me. But Chair, the subject is broad and the time is brief. I do not intend in this lecture to deal with the nuances of the meaning of academic freedom, particularly considering the many layers of complexity that the modern world has added 
to its meaning and the ways in which universities are meant to operate in relation to the publics. While this compl complexity will impact on the subject of my lecture, my primary concern is with the nature and characteristics of a university that acknowledges and accepts the academic freedom as one of the foundational values to guide the processes, operations, and internal relationships of the institution. In particular, my concern is with the obligations that the principles of academic freedom places on a university in the ways in which it will approach the educational development of its students. And for their part, the reasonable expectations that students may hold in regard to the educational experience that they will find when they choose to register at such a university. To be clear, I will use the word values to mean the things that direct our decisions and our behavior in the absence of rules. The things that make you choose to help a stranger carry their heavy groceries across the road, for example. Importantly, it is easy to see that my definition is also open to negative values, such as selfishness or racism. And I will be referring to these negative values that are sometimes threaded into our institutional cultures. The conventional understanding of academic freedom in its T.B. Davy formulation confers on the university and its academic staff the freedom to choose what shall be taught, who shall teach, who shall be taught, and how they will be taught, really capturing the freedoms over both curriculum and pedagogy in the context of this lecture. However, relying on Isaiah Berlin's conceptualization of two forms of freedoms or liberties, and Isaiah Berlin uses these terms interchangeably, the TB Davy formulation confers positive freedoms on the university. The freedom to make choices and to do certain things. Thinking about the place of students in the framework of academic freedom requires a greater focus on the negative freedoms that students can reasonably expect to find in their learning experience at the university. These are the freedoms from something, freedom from harm, freedom from unwanted exclusion based on identity, etc. And as an aside, this distinction between the forms of freedom is very intelligently explored by Margaret Atwood in her book, The Handmaid's Tale. For the purpose of this lecture, the important distinction between positive and negative freedoms is that positive freedoms belong in the domain of the individual. It allows individual agency to choose the path that the person or the institution deems best to achieve the ends that they have willingly opted to serve. Negative freedoms, on the other hand, belong in the domain of the authorities of communities or societies or nations. We grant the custodianship of these freedoms to those in authority, and we expect that our freedoms from harm or from unjustified exclusion or discrimination will be properly attended to. It is easy to see how negative freedoms become the subject of abuse by bad governments or institutional authorities. Personal surveillance or persecution of people who hold dissenting views is always justified by the need to defend the negative freedoms of a community. As always, the balance is delicate. In the context of our students, some of the negative freedoms are quite obvious. The need for security systems to provide freedom from physical harm, or the need for policies to prevent prejudice in the way that they access learning opportunities. However, I wish to stretch this argument a little further and to say that the principles of academic freedom also oblige a university to give expression to the liberating value of education by being proactive about ensuring that students have opportunity to develop the knowledge, skills, and habits of mind that allow them to maintain a skeptical attitude towards the received wisdom and to be able to critically reflect on prejudice, dogma, misconception, both their own and those of others, in their living and working lives as graduates. Together with competent classroom teaching and functional learning facilities, students should also find a university that is open to different ways of knowing and is universal in its approach to the world of ideas. And that these values are to be found in the general operation of the university 
as well as in the individual academics who teach our students. Of course, I expect that it will be difficult to find many universities in the world where the leadership will openly de declare an institutional antagonism to the principles of acad academic freedom. Indeed, apartheid also made argument that racially segregated universities were not in conflict with the principles of academic freedom. But this is not what I mean by an institution, institutional commitment to academic freedom. I rather refer to an institution that is consciously and purposefully wishes to go beyond policy statements and committee structures and to try to ensure that academic freedom finds expression as value in the ways in which different sectors of the university community relate to each other in the teaching and learning process. Or stated differently, that these values will find expression in the institutional culture of the university as it relates to student development. I recall a CHE consultative discussion on the High Education Institutional Autonomy and Academic Freedom Project sometime in 2006, where Frini Jinwala was present. Um, she had recently stepped out of the position as Speaker of the National Assembly and was perhaps able to express herself a little more freely in open forum. She asked a question which I will paraphrase as, can society trust academics with academic freedom at the modern university? This was a startling question and it has stayed with me ever since, not because it demands a yes no answer, but because it sounds a repeated warning about how fragile academic freedom is and how easily public confidence in our higher education institutions can be lost when we neglect the first principles of our purpose in the ways in which we live and work at the university. To my mind, the increased social violence and mayhem that we have been witnessing around the world over the past decade or so is a manifestation of the loss of confidence by general populations in their social institutions that in many ways have not delivered on the promise of a dignified life for all. We have to ask why angry protesters run past a church or a mosque or a, temp or, or a temple, excuse me, to burn a school or a clinic or a library. It is important that we act to sustain the confidence of our public in the value of what we do as universities so that what we do is worthy of their support and of their defense. In many ways, this need to attend to the confidence of our public, and by that I mean those to whom we speak and those on whose behalf we often speak as academics and intellectuals. That will frame much of the argument that I try to make in this lecture. In thinking about the institutional culture of a university, it may be helpful to describe this in three layers of experience by the people who engage with the university. The first layer relates to the experience of a casual visitor who spends a short time at our university, the parent of a student, say, or possible donor or a likely research collaborator from another university. Such visitors will consciously or unconsciously acknowledge the state of the buildings, the neatness of the gardens, the posters on the walls that make statements about institutional values, or carry invitations to lectures, art events, or protest meetings. They may even get a glimpse of the state of the teaching spaces, student residences, and possibly even the research facilities. Those who have visited under-resourced or otherwise troubled universities will recognize how important this first layer view is in formulating our judgment about the general operation, operational and academic culture of such an institution. The second level of institutional culture relates to the formal regulation of the relationships between different sectors of the internal university community. The academic, human resources and operational roles, the policy statements of the university and the ways in which these are meant to regulate the power and authority of relationships across the institution, including, for example, the role of the vice chancellor in determining the content of individual courses. That's a real example, by the way, that I have encountered. These rules are also meant to describe the requirements and processes for accountability by staff and students. Whether you will be called out for smoking in the hallway or playing your music too loudly in the residence or how academics are to account for the study performance of their students in their classes. 
The third and more important layer on which I particularly wish to focus is the second complex network of unwritten rules that direct individuals and committees into making choices while creating the illusion that those choices were rationally or freely made. These are what Slavoj Zizek refers to as the meta rules that make up the habits of a society or a community, including things like the rules for what is to be taken as political as polite behavior. Or the subjects that we are not to speak about in open discussion. And that may only be mentioned in low tones in private conversations. To quote Zizek more directly, and here I'm quoting, every legal order or every order of explicit normativeness has to rely on a complex network of informal rules, which tells us how we are to relate to explicit norms, how we are to apply them, to what extent we are to take them literally, and how and when we are allowed, even solicited sometimes, to disregard them." Close quote. Trying to pin down these meta rules is much like the proverbial attempt at nailing one's porridge to the wall. You feel its effects, positive or negative, without being able to point exactly to the thing or the behavior that stimulated your feeling. Early in my university career, I was thrust into academic administration and appointed as the assistant dean for undergraduate admissions in 1994. I was keen to encourage greater participation by black students in engineering studies, an objective that found expression of support from the faculty leadership at the time. However, for some of my proposed approaches, a fellow academic or administrator would say something along the lines of, that's not how we do things at WITS. Aside from the question of, the way we do things at WITS, of how the way we do things at WITS became the way that we do things at WITS. It was more interesting for me at the time to consider how the unwritten ways in which things are done at WITS became infused into the psyche of mid-level academic and administrative, and administrative staff at the faculty level, so deeply infused as to almost automate their choices on matters of practice and strategy. All institutions, of course, can speak of the unique ways in which they do things to arrive at the same outcomes as the neighboring institution. And this in itself is not a bad thing. It is good that our students leave us with a distinctive flavor, if you will, of what it means to be a UCT or a WITS or a UWC graduate. And that this flavor will include the particular habits of mind and values that the university wished to develop in its graduates. But ensuring that the impact of this flavor is always positive demands an acute awareness, particularly on the part of institutional leadership at all levels of the university, of the nature of this complex network of informal rules and the need to consciously and continually act to direct and shape its character. It's not difficult to recognize that my characteri characterization of the layers of institutional cultures locates the habits and patterns of exclusion based on identity in the third layer, where the network of unwritten rules for normative behavior has been constructed over time. This seems to me to be the way to explain the complicit behavior of staff and students at white universities in, apar in apartheid South Africa that actively prevented the participation of black academics and students in the institution. Prior socializ socialization was obviously an important contributor, but it seems that this is, does not go far enough to explain how such institutions were able to sustain the general compliance of almost the entire university community over such a long time. None of us expected that the positive and progressive changes to regulations and policies in South Africa after 1994 would see the end of, of the racism that was so strongly woven into this third level of many institutional cultures in our country. Its persistence was well illustrated with the infamous rates incident at the University of the Free State in 2008 that led to the Sodin Report on Transformation in South African Higher Education. The primary offensiveness of, of the incident did not lie in its illustration of racism in our country. I don't believe that. Rather, 
It was offensive because the students involved were close to completing their studies and graduating. A student who is academically su successful and graduates from the university with such, with such social attitudes may have been well trained, but was certainly undereducated. And my sense is that such students have possibly forfeited the right to call themselves graduates. But more importantly, the institution has failed in its duty to properly educate its students. And it is for this reason that I supported the vice chancellor's decision at the time to forgive the students. This was an appropriate acknowledgement that the real accountability lies with the university and that it needed to bring directed effort into mending the error of its ways of engagement. There are a few further points to be made for my reference to this UFS inc incident, and of course the many other such instances at universities that happen not to make the media headlines. It is important and correct that we take for granted that our students will arrive at our universities with a wide range of prejudices about all sorts of other identities that they constructed in their lived experience with family, friends and community. It is the task of the university to ensure that its students find sufficient opportunity to test and reflect on these prejudices and to leave the university as successful graduates having an opportunity had an opportunity to see the world through the eyes of the other. We do not expect that the Catholics will leave as Protestants or that the supporters of the Palestinian people's cause will leave as champions of Zionism. But we do expect our students to leave with an intellectual attitude that guides them on the path of the reason and sensitive search for the truth in all that they will encounter as university graduates in the world of ideas. Instances like the rates incident also alert us to the fact that all the engagements that our students experience while at our university are part of their learning opportunities. We must be more consciously aware of all the informal contributions to learning. And as with formal, formal classroom learning, we must ensure that it is positively directed. A badly cleaned lecture room or an ill-spoken word from a lecturer or an administrator all contribute to negative learning opportunities for our students. The negative attitudes and approaches that we may hold about our students, about their learning abilities or about their academic achievements derive from what is referred to as the pathologies of institutional culture. The things and behaviors that operate at the level of the meta rules and act to marginalize, exclude or hurt particular groups of the university community and that ultimately act to corrupt our primary, our primary purpose which is to bring meaning to complexity in the process of developing the next generation of graduates and intellectuals who will go out to engage with the critical questions of the human condition in more positive and more development, developmental ways than we did. We are duty bound to ensure that our students do and achieve better than we did. Please excuse me. Thank you. To return to the matter of institutional pathologies, I use the word pathology here in its medical sense to indicate a disease or an abnormality that requires specialist attention, time and remedial treatment to be eliminated. Like Bram Stoker's vampires, these pathologies are ideas and habits that skulk around in the dark, feeding on and infecting those who are close but they crumble and vaporize as soon as they're exposed to the light of open and reasoned argument. Sometimes these habits may be well-intentioned, but they have seriously hurtful consequences, such as that most corrosive form of racism that expects less from people considered as the other, and is at pains sometimes to apologize for poor behavior or poor performance on the basis of their blackness, or their townshipness or their poorness. In a country like ours trying hard at least at the level of regulation and policy to remove the hurtful habits of othering that was acquired during apartheid, negative discrimination, discrimination based on identity 
can only operate at the level of the informal network of meta rules that directs the behavior of those who work and learn in the institution. The fact that our staff and students arrive with prior so socialization that include these pathologies of behavior is not a reason for their continued existence in our institutional cultures. We must resist the paralyzing argument that I often hear that the university is a microcosm of its society. We should rather aim for the university to be a microcosm of what society could be like. We should set the tone as we speak to our public. To illustrate a point, imagine that an academic accepts a post at a university and upon arriving at work, realizes that fellow academics commonly accept bribes from students to inflate their assessment grades. If our newly appointed academic finds that the university leaders are unwilling to hear protestations against such practice, he or she will have to conclude that this is part of the institutional culture. And if they are clear minded, would find such values so offensive that they would choose to leave the institution. Equally, if someone joins our university and holds firmly to their sense of their own racial or gender superiority, they should find our institutions so affirming of all in its community that they would rather that they would either be convinced to change their views or choose to resign. The values that are embedded in our institutional culture and that are meant to direct our choices and behavior, even in the absence of rules, must drip from the walls of the institution so that all can recognize its presence and feel its effects. Allow me at this point to make a particular comment on that most pernicious form of informally institutionalized harm, that is gender-based violence, in all its manifestations, but mostly directed by men against women. It touches on a sensitive part of our souls where we don't like to be touched, because it reminds us of all forms of brute human power and its relationship with powerlessness. I'm attracted to Pumla Dola's argument that while it is factually correct to say that most men will not rape a woman, this is not a useful starting point for understanding the place and meaning of gender-based violence in our societies. The reason is that each time a man goes out to rape or purposely hurt a woman, like all men, I'm a beneficiary. What the rapist does is to reinforce the patterns of masculinity and patriarchy that are part of the meta rules of society and that form the habits of our social institutions. The rapist is part of the mechanism that ensures that patterns of patriarchy are continually reproduced. Thanks to the rapist, I am more likely to have my hands placed on the levers of power in society than a woman may be. We make the same argument about racism. Not all white or German people did terrible things to black or Jewish people in apartheid South Africa or in Germany before the Second World War. But all white or German people were beneficiaries of the exclusion of blacks or Jews from a social justice system that was meant to protect the important parts of their positive freedom at the time. The freedom to pursue a happy and meaningful life in one's society. In these kinds of circumstances, it is not possible to make an argument for collective guilt, but it is possible to make an argument for collective responsibility. It is for this reason that on the matter of gender-based violence, all men have to acknowledge their responsibility and must actively work to develop an institutional culture that will not try to find ways to accommodate or apologize for such brutish behavior. Institutional values and with it the institutional culture do and are meant to find expression in the structure of the curriculum and the way in which we teach our students. In its formal sense, teaching is the front end of our task in engaging with the process of education as a liberating experience for the next generations of intellectuals who, as I've said, will do better, see differently and much further than we did. I've long held the belief and permit me to say that I do not care to dispute with those who disagree with me on this matter, that the teaching space and the relationship between those who wish to teach and those who wish to learn is a sacred space. This relationship cannot be described in pecuniary terms, 
And it is here that we as teachers are to make good on the promise that we gave to the parents and families of our students, that we will provide them with a good quality and proper education, and that to the best of our ability, we will ensure that they leave us as positively engaged graduates. There may be times when it is necessary to interfere in the learning space, but like declarations of war, we must always make such choices with great reluctance. Apartheid's interference in this space, in the education of both black and white South Africans, was one of its greatest harms, and one from which we certainly have yet to recover. Political movements around the world were driven by one or other crackpot dogma, and who turn children into soldiers or keep girl children out of school will visit equal harm on the heads of their fellow citizens. In reflecting on the form and process of teaching and learning at the university that has chosen to actively express the principles of academic freedom in all of its functions, it is important to keep in mind Max Weber's caveat about the limits of a university education. A university education is not meant to answer the big questions that all human beings are, re are required to respond to. Who am I? How should I live? What choices should I make? These are questions that our students must answer for themselves. And at the broader level, our task is to give context to such questions and to develop in our students the reasoning ability to arrive at defensible answers in a world that is complex and frighteningly ambiguous. It is in this sense that I have argued in the title to this lecture that ours is to educate, not to captivate not to make our students captive to particular worldviews, particular social or political views, or particular forms of knowledge about the empirically observable world. Of course, this does not mean that those who teach should pretend to be completely neutral on all matters of debate or dispute. Such an approach may well cause more harm to the learning experience of their students. My sense is that teaching in the context of the liberating value of education means to enable our students to positively, positively engage with the unfamiliar while also helping them to see the familiar in unfamiliar ways and encouraging in them a skeptical attitude towards all received knowledge, including the theories and hypotheses that they receive from us. This requires that we develop in our students the habits of mind and reasoning characteristics of intellectuals, a sense of the value of knowledge for its own sake. Um, a capacity for critical thinking outside of one's discipline, an ability to keep two diametrically opposing ideas in your mind and still be fully functional, celebrating rather than merely tolerating diversity of opinion as a core value, recognizing respectful criticism as the finest gift that one can give or receive. And at the end of a hard day of argument, of analysis, of defense of a strongly held view, being willing to quietly say, I may have been wrong today. It is our capacity to develop, in our to develop our students in this way that leads people like Anthony O'Hare to, re to refer to the university as a civilizing force, or Peter Scott to speak of the university as contributing to a political world more sensitive to reason and more civilized in its search for the truth. Our students should experience this approach to, to learning development in both the first curriculum, which, the, which are the formal engagements that students have with course material, as well as in the second curriculum, what our students learn from the fact of being at and engaging with a university that sees its values as being valuable. The second curriculum is also about the architectural approach that we take to organizing the university campus, and particularly the teaching and learning spaces. This was probably my most valuable lesson at Salt Lake University. Careful attention to beautiful and functional learning spaces encourages better and deeper learning in students. To return to our casual visitor to the campus, it's important that we ask ourselves questions such as, what is it about the architectural arrangements of the physical spaces that will tell a casual visitor that this is a university that is seriously positive about womanness, say? or that this is a university where no one should feel pressure to apologize for their identity. 
As I said earlier, the values embedded in the institutional culture must be so strongly expressed that it drips from the walls of the university. I think it's fair to say that the university that valorizes one cultural view or one way of knowing above all others cannot help but to under educate its students. On the other hand, the students who enroll at a university that commits to the principles of academic freedom can reasonably, reasonably expect that those who teach them will be open to the possibility of other ways of knowing. And there are types of problems that are insoluble unless one is willing to be led by the hand to stand in an unfamiliar or sometimes uncomfortable place from which to view the problem, as we often expect our students to do. This is not an unusual approach in many knowledge areas. And, and, and the area of complex number theory makes a useful illustration. Complex number theory is a branch of mathematics that relies on a starting arg argument that I'm going to write on the board. Complex number theory relies on the equation, I hope you can see it on the board, x squared plus one equals naught, and it says that it has a solution. To all that we know and have been taught about numbers, this is a ridiculous proposition because it requires that we accept that the square root of minus one exists. As you can see, the solution to that equation is x equals minus, uh, square root of minus one. Yet there are a wide range of problems in disciplines from electrical supply to quantum mechanics that cannot be solved unless we accept complex, num uh, uh, complex number analysis as another way of knowing numbers, frightening as it may, may sound at first. Similarly, the teacher who acknowledges only a European worldview or speaks only English, say, will lack both the words and the conceptual understanding of family or community connectedness in much of Asia, Africa or South America. Such a teacher would find it strange that they are, these are people's who have more than one word for uncle, more than one word for grandmother. In an anthropology, politics or public health class faced with African, Chinese or Indian students, such a teacher would be the educationally disadvantaged in the class and may have to attend a bridging course uh, to improve his or her capacity to teach. There are some aspects in which the university and its teaching staff are underprepared for the learning needs of the students who attend our classes. The educational development of our students is best served when those who teach them are sensitive to the complexities and the ways of reasoning in disciplines outside of their own. Of course, we cannot be specialists in many disciplines at the same time, but we should at least try to be reasonably enlightened amateurs through the habit of broad intellectual engagement. Too often do I meet academics who believe that the only subject of intelligent intellectual discussion is their own research area, and that all other knowledge areas are obvious to the average mind. This is most unbecoming of anyone who wishes to claim the title academic or intellectual. A sectarian approach to disciplinary knowledge can only be harmful to our students. While students in the pure and applied sciences certainly need greater engagement with issues and arguments in the humanities and the liberal arts, I'm also concerned that one of the big threats to democracy in the modern world is the poverty of scientific understanding in our humanities graduates and the ease with which they hand their futures over to technocrats on important matters of the relationship between technology and society. If knowledge is truly to be about challenging power, then developing a foundational understanding and a respectful approach to ways of knowing in other disciplines is essential for our graduates. And these are the habits of mind that our students should also find in those who teach them. Chair, a final word on the liberating value of education and its relationship with the decolonizing project. I have elsewhere expressed my concern about the willingness of recent discussions on decolonizing the curriculum in South African universities. My primary concern has been that the discussion confuses the curriculum with the content of the curriculum and as a consequence 
focuses particularly on curriculum issues in the humanities. There's a level of silliness in the idea of removing Shakespeare or Western science, whatever that may mean, from the teaching activities at a university. And in this context, it is worth taking a mirror reflection from M.A. Césaire's caution to European intellectuals against their self-satisfying reductionism, which he said has the potential, and I quote here, to amputate man from the human and to isolate him permanently in a suicidal pride, if not in a rational and scientific form of barbarism. Uh, close quotes. You will have to excuse Césaire's gender bias in that quote. Yeah. But we must also note his point of, that rationalism and scientific method can also be instruments of barbarism. Scientific method can be brought in the service of unspeakable purposes, uh, and we've seen that throughout the world in many contexts. The decolonizing project is better framed around the task, as Ngugi Wationgo describes it, of decolonizing minds. It is here that the university can make its most significant contribution to its public through the educational development of graduates who will stretch the front end of human endeavor with warm hearts and with fine minds and who are always awake to the big questions of human suffering, environmental sustainability, and the relationships between power and powerlessness. But this requires that we as university teachers develop our own understanding and our commitment to the idea of a university that holds academic freedom principles at the core of its values. To be fair, our students deserve no less. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Professor Bellum, for, for the really thoughtful um, intervention. Uh, as uh, I said, there will be time for questions. There, there's been one or two questions typed into um, the, the question um, page already, the Q&A page. Uh, so the, I will put a few of them to you and uh, hopefully you <laughs> can respond. Um, Luiso said the, the question possibly is uh, one of concern about an abuse of academic freedom and a lack of accountability, I assume, by academics. Uh, what is your view about the tension between academic freedom, the freedom to teach and research what you want, and academics not really being accountable uh, as I understand it, to create that university that you sp spoke so eloquently about. Thank you. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think that's a real concern, and I and I raised the the question that Trini Jinwala raised about can the public trust academics with academic freedom? I was at a a, a discussion at Wits once, and and I was making an argument for foundational values, and one of the academics in the room, uh, I think, was an economist said, but a university is a place where we don't share values. Um, I was a little bit sharp on my feet that day because I said to him, well, if I agree with you, then that's a shared value. Uh, and I think that's an important point to make. An institution must, you don't have to write this down, but there must be a cluster a handful of shared values where the institution feels it will, beyond which it will not go. Um, an academic who arrives saying that they refuse to teach a class that has um, women in it or gay people in it. Well, there's just no conversation we're having. Uh, you better have a, a weapon in your hand because that's the only conversation we're going to have. If we can't agree on the first principle, which is that every every person as as individual and as member of a community deserves the right to a dignified life. If we can't agree on that principle, then no conversation is possible. So academic freedom, of course, comes with limits, as all freedoms do. And there is a space in which some things must be considered as not negotiable. And ac academics have to rise to the challenge. Uh, ac academic freedoms bring uh, all the freedoms that all citizens would, would, would normally enjoy. But even as we express our freedom and living in a community, we acknowledge the, the, the fact that there are limits to those freedoms and that at the interface, they must be negotiated. So no, I don't have any direct answers, and I don't think that there is a, 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 form, a formula that would give us the answer. I do think that this is one that, con that in institutions must continuously be negotiating. 
And so the fact that there is an academic freedom committee at a university, to my mind, is an important consideration. And it seems to me that that's where the, the debate should be happening. I hope I've answered the question. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Vellum. Um, so uh, Betty Ann has also posed a question, um, a more practical question. Uh, would something like a compulsory philosophy course in the first year help to develop the kind of critical thinking and this ideal student or the ideal product of the uni ideal university that you envisaged? Um, there, there, of course, there, there have been significant movements in this area. Uh, concern that engineers are, are not sufficiently uh, attuned or aware uh, of the forms of debate in the humanities. Um, the arrangements now at all engineering programs is that we, we have compulsory courses uh, that have non-engineering context, non-management context, uh, and students are introduced. And I, I mean, I do think that, that those are useful, but I, th I do think also that they have limits. Um, the fact that a student attends a course does not necessarily mean that the student that that course will influence a student's behavior. Uh, many of our students in law, accounting, uh, etc., attend courses on ethics. Um, we can sometimes ask, well, uh, their behavior doesn't always uh, reflect the fact that they actually did attend a course and passed it, by the way. My argument is rather that that the approaches should be infused into the way we teach. And I don't want, just as I'm concerned about creating a corner where we say, a bit like my, my concern with academic development programs, that's a corner where certain people go to uh, to be corrected or fixed. Um, I rather think that the, the way in which students engage with all our teaching, with all the learning opportunities, should be directed to infuse the kind of openness to other ways of knowing. Um, and it is possible to do that. It's possible to do it in the mathematics class. Um, uh, I, I really do. And I do think that the, I mean, it, it, for me, and I want to express this as a concern, I know it, it's difficult to, to repair it, but I worry that we've taken our medical students off to a separate campus at many of our universities. They never have a chance to sit next to a philosophy student in, in the canteen. Uh, they don't sit next to uh, a physics student. They don't engage in debates uh, on matters that young people should be concerned with uh, in conversation with what must be the exciting world of being in the company of fine young minds. Um, I mean, I must say that was my experience of university, um, was this astounding feeling that I was in the company of people who were much, much smarter than me. And that I had the opportunity to 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 share in their ideas, to, to consider their views. And when we start isolating our students uh, in both the first and the second curricula, uh, I think we do harm to our students. So while I think these courses help, I don't think that they should be the only strategy for responding. Thank you. OK, thank you for answering that question. Um, a question that I was also thinking about while you were speaking, Professor Baller, uh, is Van Boosle, who asked, what, in response to your call for decolonizing minds, uh, what does it mean to expect a decolonized curriculum or that kind of openness from educators who are not necessarily trained or do, do not have um, the, the kind of skills to make this possible, who are not, so to speak, decolonized themselves, and I would add, are not going to ever be. I'm not willing to give up so easily on people. Um, I think that, I, I, I mean, I, I do think that the issues, the issues are difficult and I don't want to pretend that it's easy, but let me give you an example. Uh, I was taught civil engineering. I happened, it happened to be in, in I, was, I was a student in this very class where I'm standing. Um, at a time when the, the national building re regulations, the standard building regulations, had different water pressure requirements for black people, uh, for Africans, Indians, coloreds, and white people. Of course, uh, white people uh, having, you had to provide higher water pressures for white people in those days. I don't hold my lecturers accountable for the standard building regulations. They didn't write that. 
But I do hold them accountable for not telling their class that that was not proper civil engineering. That that while they that while we had to oblige in the way that we designed, it was important for my academics to 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 alert their students to the fact that that was improper engineering. And in that context, uh, the the engineers who were educated when I when I graduated were perhaps undereducated. So my sense is that decolonizing minds has got has little to do with the curriculum itself. It is possible to teach um, uh, King Lear in a township narrative. Uh, that is possible. It's possible to 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 draw um, significant lessons about the lived experience of all our students uh, from reading Joseph Conrad, for example. This, this is great literature, particularly because of its ability to, to cross boundaries, to ignore tribal linguistic and national boundaries. Because the world of ideas that we want to in, infuse into our students is one that it will ignore those boundaries. I, for example, have one of the people who don't believe that we should fly a, a, a flag at the university. There are occasions when we should do it, uh, particular national days or when we get a visit from a senior politician, uh, we should fly the flag. But I'm I'm always cautious about a university that too strong on its national identity. The problem that we are to face are problems that have national limits. Uh, poverty is not a, a, a South African problem. HIV AIDS is not a South African problem. And that in, in the way in which we solve the, and approach the solution to these problems, we have much to teach the rest of the world, but also much to learn from. And so the issue of decolonizing the curriculum is not so much about the content of the curriculum, but rather the way in which we structure the curriculum. And I think uh, the Vice Chancellor made that point in opening introduction. All universities would do well to revise and consider its curriculum. And you know, you could, for example, say we need uh, to have to talk about HIV AIDS in uh, in the curriculum. But if you leave it to an academic who believes firmly uh, that uh, uh, HIV is for people who are not Christians or people who are who have committed a sin, then you're actually hurting the cause. And so, together with the content, with the idea must come an, an association and acculturation with the openness to, to other ways of knowing and, and other ways of thinking about uh, the way in which our students learn. Uh, this is too brief a, a, a session to talk about decolonizing, decolonizing the mind. But I mean, I, let, me, let me give you a, a quick example. And I, it's a point I made earlier today in, a, in another meeting. I'm, I'm deeply ashamed that I can walk into a bookshop in India and find Nelson Mandela's Long Walk to Freedom in any Indian language. I can't buy that book in Shivenda or in Sichuana. It's impossible to get it. The extent to which we have neglected African languages in our country is a reflection of Ali Mazrui's point that Sub-Saharan Africa cannot claim to be the most brutalized community but it can claim to be the most humiliated. And the extent to which we persist in our neg neglect of things that are identified as African is a reflection of the persistence of that humiliation. I want to say that, I mean, I'm not for a minute arguing that we should start teaching in, in African languages, but the persistence of our in unwillingness to acknowledge the archive of the other in our own country is a reason for for the colonial arguments that we're still having with ourselves. The fact that many of my white colored Indian friends, colleagues are not even able to greet in an African language is something we should think seriously about and argue that perhaps there's a there's a value issue here that needs engagement. I'm using that simply as an example, but I think there, there, there's a broader conversation to be had. Um, I hope I've quickly responded to that. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you for that, uh, Professor Balam. Obviously, it raises the questions of power and, and power in so many different and complicated ways and who has it in even in informal ways. So um, there's one or two more questions I think we have time for. Keith asks, as regard to the ownership of student learn uh, of the student learning journey, how best 
can universities encourage students to engage in the co-creation of learning as opposed to the liberal uh, model of or the new liberal model of students being clients and they are passive receivers of knowledge yeah i i, I must say uh, it always it always just presses me my, the wrong button for me when people refer to our students as clients and and even worse um, our, our courses as products um, uh, I, we, we, we really must resist that kind of language. Uh, our students are not our clients in the sense that, I mean, there's a simplistic way to think about it. If they don't imbibe our values, uh, which is about performance, but also uh, institutional culture values, uh, we, not only do we take their money, we chase them away as well. Um, and I think it's important that we, 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 we not think of our students as clients. On the other hand, I do think that students have have a, a, a serious responsibility in regard to their own education. Of course, it may be improper to ask a first year student to do this, but as students progress to, through the curriculum and, and, and advance through their, their studies, I've always been concerned that, that I don't find students standing with us shoulder to shoulder in defense of the quality of the program. Uh, it worries me when that happens. Uh, the, the international comparability of our, of our degrees is as important to the university as it is to our graduates. Um, whenever a university experiences a breach in its security systems and a report comes out that uh, somebody faked a degree or was able to access the IT system and print a fake degree or qualification, the, the loudest protests come from our graduates because what we what we've done in, in not attending sufficiently to the integrity of our systems is we've compromised the quality of the degree that they've left with. That said, I still find that we, we, we need to find ways to, that encourages students to acknowledge that what, they, what they're doing and the quality of the education that they're getting is worthy not only of defense, but also of improvement and that their contribution should be made in that regard. Can I say that it is it is with that it was with that in mind that I made the comment about that corrosive form of racism that expects less of other people. Um, I mean, I'm occasionally hear stories about st black students who prefer white supervisors because white because white supervisors expect less from them, um, and the white supervisor may even help to write the thesis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I, I, I really find that disconcerting and I, and I think that we need to be careful that we don't fall into that trap and that actually it is the duty of students to stand up and say that is not acceptable in the way that I expect to be educated. And so part of it is about taking students, our students along with us. Part of it is about student leadership engaging more consciously, more progressively about the way in which not only the way in which they are taught, but the way in which the next generation of students will be taught at this institution. And that's an important point. Most of the conversations about institutional transformation actually have little to do with us. By the time the impact is felt, we probably won't be here. Some of the younger academics may be, but certainly most of the students will have left. But custodianship of the institution for the yet unborn is the duty of all of us, including our students. So yeah, I do think that we can do a lot more about that. As I say, I have no concrete proposals on that subject. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Balin. The, the difficulty of, of making also students excited in ways that, that makes them do more than they otherwise would have done is, is the one that many of us live with. Maybe a last question um, from the Tembi Korsi, um, who says, May, I believe it does not help to teach so-called liberal critical thinking alone, which tends to be quite abstract and ahistorical. Uh, what do you think about the proposition to teach critical thinking together with the kind of theory? Otherwise, we uh, cannot succeed in decolonizing or reimagining how the world should change um, in this way. I, yes, I don't know if you have an answer to that. <laughs> yeah, 
It is. I mean, there's, a, there's an easy answer. Yes, of course, I agree. Uh, but I, I, I expect that the, that the person who raised the question didn't intend that. I think, I mean, I think I agree. What we don't want is critical reasoning ability of people who sit under trees all day uh, and think about uh, uh, super ideas that only only the, the, the high level philosophers should be the custodians of. That's not what we intend to do. I mean, I do think when I use the word intellectuals, I'm using it in, in the way that I think Gramsci used it, which is sort of in a, uh, the critically engaged intellectuals. Those who go out and using intellectual effort make, make society think differently about what it does or what it used to do. And in that sense, everybody, all, all, all our graduates qualify, engineers, philosophy students, uh, humanities graduates, lawyers, all will go out and bring intellectual effort into the ways in which society thinks about what it does. But if we think about the harm that we are handing over, the harmful world that we are handing over to the next generation, we have to ask ourselves, what choices did we make that allowed us to, to damage the environment as badly as we have? Uh, what were the choices, what was the reasoning process that allowed us to, to bring so much human suffering into the world as we see today? Um, how did we allow those in power to get away with such uh, brutish approaches? I mean, the, the collapse of the of the global economy in 2008-2009 was a cynic was a cynical uh, in event. It was about giving poor people debt that we that the companies knew could not be paid, then kicking them out of their houses when they couldn't pay. And then very cynically taking that debt and trading it as a commodity. My sense is that the people who arrived at those decisions were all university graduates. What we have to do is ask ourselves, we're not going to solve this problem in the next few years, but how do we change views that, say, that reminds our graduates that a balance sheet is a representation of reality, like an equation. It's a representation of reality, it's not reality. And it requires a balance sheet like an equation requires that we read it through the lenses of our values. And hopefully accountants will be, as I said, a little more sensitive. Uh, bankers, those with the, the hands on the levers of financial power will be a little bit more sensitive about the impact of the decision on the most marginal in our society. And I do think that is that level of critical reasoning together with the theory that goes with it, that must be infused into our day-to-day -day interaction with our students. Um, uh, again, that was a question that, that is probably a subject of a, of a very large lecture, uh, but it, it, I hope I've added and made a contribution to, to the discussion. Uh, uh, Chair, if this is the last question, then I, I, I want to say to the audience, I do hope that I've brought shone, shone some light on the subject that you found interesting. Um, and uh, I think my email is quite easy to get. So if anybody still has further criticism, and I look forward to your criticism, uh, I'd be happy to receive an email. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ballam, Yunus, if, if I may, uh, for the really stimulating and uh, thought-provoking um, lecture. I'm not just <laughs> saying that. It's something we're all grappling with is how to deal with an in, uh, uh, and change an institutional culture with which as you said very um uh, presciently the where many of the rules are not the written rules and where uh, even when there are written rules some of those rules themselves reflect a certain view of the world a certain life experience and so on um, and even for academics who are supposed to be critical uh, just unreflectively endorsing or not uh, thinking that it is possible to change the rules. So I, for me personally, I think that is very important. The huge challenge I think that many of us face in the university is the, the question of how to create this one wonderful place where there's real critical contestation, where things are open in an uh, environment in which some um, traditions, intellectual traditions, 
epistemologies and so on are dominant and where the, where the marginal, so-called marginal voices um, are not heard or are not taken seriously or taken up uh, sometimes out of defensiveness or for whatever other reason. It is a huge challenge, I think, for, for the university to, with, with what we have, to make that the university more vibrant and to make us all more open to even to the ideas that we don't know about or not know enough about. So um, on that note, once again, thank you very much um, for uh, uh, agreeing to do the lecture and for the wonderful input. Um, uh, and also thank you very much to the audience for um, attending and for the very interesting questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to every question, but I tried to um, uh, select at least a representative sample. Um, it is wonderful uh, that uh, the staff, students and the UCT community can come together like this although unfortunately not in person. Thank you very much uh, to everyone um, and good night. Thank you all and good night. Bye bye.